So where are we up to? So we're looking at the Yalkut Biurim on pay on pay base. That's where we stopped. And we're on the left column. And we're analyzing the Machlokis Rabbi Yochanan Reish according to the Rajba. And so far we quoted Rabbi Chaim Oz of the Achiezer. And he says that the Rajba has a fundamental principle. And that is that once the Torah was matir in any particular situation, the Isa of Eishas Ach, that heter can never be removed. And the Achiezer points out that that would be the Rashba's explanation of Rabbi Yochanan, that according to Rabbi Yochanan, once, once the Torah was matir, a woman for Yibum, then there cannot be an Eishas Ach. And therefore, when one of the brothers gives her chalitza, then after that, as far as all the brothers are concerned, there's only a lot. We reduce it from Ashes Ach Kores down to a lot. But this explanation of the Rashba would not help us with uh, Reish Lakish, because Reish Lakish holds that as far as all the other Achim, with the exception of the Cholates, there's an Isu Kores. However, the Karen Ora, and others apparently, they want to explain based on the Ushalmi that even Reish Lakish accepts this principle, which means that once the Torah was Matir, H is Af, that Heter is Chal ad infinitum. So now the question is then, according to Reish Lakish, why is there an Isra H is Af vis-a-vis the other Achim? And the answer is that we're going to apply the principle of Lumafre. And as a result of the chalitza of, let's call him Shimon, Igloy Milsa Lumafreya, that Levi and other brothers, there was never an afila for Yibu. May Olam Lahaisa Nafila Liyibu, and there was never a matir on the Easter Ashes. Now, if this be the case, we now could justify why. Did uh, Rabbi Yochanan add the following words as the Gemara quotes it here in Daf Yudam and Beis? Shlichusa di Achim ka'avit. Or Shlichusa di Tsara ka'avna. If the logic of, Beis, of um, Rabbi Yochanan is that once the Torah was matir eshtsach, that had to remain forever and ever, he didn't have to justify it by introducing Shlichus and concepts like that that are totally irrelevant. The answer is that Rabbi Yochanan is coming la fuke reishlokish. And he's saying that according to you, reishlokish, your logic is lamafreya. Why do you have to go lamafreya? Why introduce the strange halacha of lamafreya? I glory to lamafreya that they never fell for even to the other brothers, only to the cholics. No, leave that out. The logic that's compelling would be shlichus. And the reason why all the tsara samutaros with one chalitza is because of shlichus. And the reason why we should reduce the erva of Eishas Ach as far as all the other Achim is concerned is not because of Igloi Milsum Afreya, but because of shlichus, that the cholitz is operating on behalf as an agent on behalf of all the other brothers. And now in the next paragraph, he quotes Rabbi Naftali Tra. I don't know if you ever heard of him. And he writes that according to Rabbi Yochanan, there's no need for the logic of shlichus in order to downgrade, to devaluate the, uh, the lav of, of Kari Savashis Ach to a re- down, downgrade it to regular lav. In other words, if you're going with the Rashba, we've removed the Easter of Eshesach through Nafil of the Yibu, and all the Tsaras and all the brothers have, have that Nafil of the Yibu. But the reason why Rabbi Yochanan is compelled to add 
the logic and formulate shlichus is because how do we know that the lav of lo yibana, which applies to the cholets, should apply to all the other brothers? Maybe as far as all the other brothers are concerned, we remove the isra eshesa through the nefila for yibu, and there is no lav of lo yibana. It's uh, on on a balabatich level psychologically. We could explain the granat this way. I don't think this is what he meant, but I'm just saying just let sabres ozen. That the Choles was the one who had to make a decision between two alternatives, Yibum and Chalitza. And he, cho- he chose the wrong one. Why? Because the Torah says that he should be Makayim, he should be Bone, a bias from the Yivama. But Lo Yivne, if it's Lo Yivne, then because he chose Chalitza as opposed to Yibum, then we're going we're gonna, to uh, paste we're going to slap them with a lav of lo yivna. But the other brothers, they didn't even have an option of yivu because this brother was the one who stood up, you know, at the plate and he decided chalitza as opposed to yivu. So the lo yivna, which means that you were mavatal, the essay of building a house, that lav of lo yivna is, is addressed specifically to the chalets and not to the other brothers. And now we're on pay gimel, which I think you have, right? The Yushami quoted Rab Chia. I think we've seen this in the past that there's no machlok shin Rab Yochanan Eishlokish regard to tsaras chalutza. The bein hacholets who bein haachim chayovim aleha. Kuritz. Alman nechliku ala chalutza atzma. Chal Rabbi Yochanan eno chayav aleha kuritz. Aval ha'achim chayavim kuritz. Again, with regard to Tzara's chalutza, Everybody agrees, even Rabbi Yochan agrees that there's a chiyuv karis. The machlok is between Rabbi Yochan and Reish Lakish, falls on the case of the chalutza herself, what her status is. And Rabbi Yochanan says that there's no chiyuv karis vis a vis the chalutza. It's unbelievable. The Yushalmi is really restricting, l- severely limiting the scope of the Machlokas Shun of Yochan Reishlokas. They're only arguing what's the status of the Chalutza. If, let's say, Shimon gave Chalutza to, we'll call her Leah, and then he had a relationship with Leah, would that be a violation of an Isakaris? And Rabbi Yochan says no. And Mishlokish says, just one second. Aval ha'achim chayovim karis, so Mishlokish bein hu bein ha'achim pturim ikaris. Oh my goodness. This is very hard for us. You know, we got so used to the Mishlokish in Bavli. Now we have Mishlokish in Yerushalmi. It's a whole new story. Because the basic machlokis is whether we equate all the, all the ladies, you know, all the wives of Ruvain, of the late Ruvain, and, and do we equate all the brothers of Ruvain. That's the machlokis fundamentally between Beit Silel and Beit Shama. I'm sorry, between, sorry, uh, carry over from my previous uh, shir. Between Rabbi Yochan and Reish Lakish, right? Reish Lakish was always the one who equated all of them together, uniformly. But in the Bavli, that's a Chumra. In the Yushalmi, that's a Kula. Why? Because Aluta herself is is excluded from cards. Did I get that right? Right. 
right? Eino Chayev Oleha Karis. So we have now, according to Rabbi Yochan, because again, Rabbi Yochan always goes unique, if you follow what I mean, because the Lo Yivnet is, a, is, is earmarked just for the, chal, for the Cholets and the Chalutza. That's Rabbi Yochan. Rish Lakish holds that whatever applies to the Cholets and the Chalutza applies to all the Tzaros and all the Ach. Then it turns out that Rabbi Rish Lakish is the making. Why? Because Rabbi Yochan says that as far as this unique halach of lo yivna that only applies to the cholitz and the chalutz, we reduce it from kares to olav. For all the other brothers and all the sorrows, it's going to remain an isa kares. And Reish Lakish, who has not the unique shita, but the uniform shita, he's going to apply that reduction, downgrading from kares to olav, to all the achim and all the tzorah. That's what he says here. Ulreish Lokish bein hu bein aachim pturim likares. Oh, good job, my friend. Reish Lokish becomes a megil. He shita shlitzes shlo uzkar bebavli. She hishva as did sorrows ludina ach. So one second. So let's see. I think we're missing one piece of the puzzle. Second. Let's go. Let's, uh... Again, let's go back to take it from the top again. Isa Vishalmi Bashem Rabbi Chiyabar Bara Barba. Lo Nechliku Bes Rabbi Yochanan Vresh Lokish Al Tsoras Hachalutza. Shebena Chole to Bena Achim Chayoven Oleho Kores. If would you do me a big favor? Would you mind closing the door of the office there? I don't think Robert Myers will object. It's just that I'm having trouble concentrating. If you want, I'll do it. To, so give me another minute here to. Thank you so much. Wow, that makes it so much easier to concentrate. Again, Lo Nechleku, Rabbi Yochanan, Reish Lokish, Al Tsaras Hachalutza. Shebena Cholets, Ubena Achim, Chayovin Oleha Koret. Al Nechleku, Al Hachalutza Atzmo. Shal Rabbi Yochanan, who, I think the word who means the cholates, eno chayev ole karis. Avala achim chayovim karis. That's as far as the chalutz is concerned. As far as the tsara is concerned, everybody agrees, Rish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan, that everybody, all the achim are chayev karis. As far as the chalutz is concerned, the he shita shlishi shlo huzkar v'bavli she hishva as din sorrows l'din ha'achim. Now, one second, this comment here, if I'm not mistaken, 
that's only relevant to Rabbi Yochan. And let's just see. According to Rish Lakish, I don't see any difference in between the Tsaros and the Achim. Is that correct? That just like the just like the Achim are all Bechi of Kares, that applies not only to the Chalutza, but to, to all the Tsaros as well. So what does he mean? Shalohuzkara Bibavli. Ishva in sorrows within Aachen. You show me this thing was that the status of the sorrows is is equal to the status of Aachen, and they're all the of current. And you shot and the Babli never mentioned it. Okay, but I don't know that Bavli would necessarily disagree with that. I don't know. Anyway, Vitama Shom Rabbi Yudin, Ma Chiluk Yesh, the Gabaya Achim, Beino Levain Sarosa. Again, Beino, I think, is a reference to the Halutza. I don't have it yet. I don't know if, gentlemen, you you could figure this out and tell me, shot. I'm not ready for this yet, but let's see. But sometimes if you read a little vita, it makes it easier. He says, Kosovo Pnei Moshe, Shemi Komakom, Muchach, Mishita Zu, Rak Legabaya Achim, Amrina, Shlichusa, Ka'ovda, Balkain Kulam, that's again according to according to Rach Lokich. This is Rach Lokich, right? In the in the in the Uchalm. Avul Gabiat Soros Ain Nechsheves Hachalitza. Nasa is Bishlichus Kulo. Kaviat Soros, Ain Nechsheves Achalutso. And what about the other sorrows? So what's the din of the other sorrows? Let's go over this again. According to Rabbi Yochanan. Ah, no. He said... That the machlokes between Rabbi Yochanan and Shlokes is as far as the Achim is concerned. But everybody agrees that the Tsaros have a chiv karis. And, and Rabbi and Rabbi uh, Rish Lokis, second, and Rish Lokis, Rish Lokis, second. As far as the Cholit is concerned, as far as the Cholit is concerned, is Rabbi Yochanan says that the Cholit is not high of Kares, the Achim Achai of Kares, and Reish Lokish says that if you're already downgrading in the case of the Cholates from a kares to down to a love. Let's do the same for the other ach. But as far as the tsara is concerned, as 
everybody agrees that there is a few chorus. So what's he saying about Shlichusa Ka'ovid? Gaviyatzoros ein mechsheves achalitza naseis v'shlichus kulon And therefore everybody agrees both from Yochan and Rishlokesh agree that the Tzoros Chalutza is a Chiv Karis. And again, what is the Machlokes now? It's as far as the Achim are concerned. And Rishlokesh wants to apply the Ptura to all the Achim. Ah. But he's saying here in the name of the play Moshe I remember I once heard from I was learning with her Moshe Chortsky and he said that the play Moshe is he called him the Balabas on the Yushal but he says <coughs> that there's a one way shlichus here or maybe that's not the right accurate phrase, but that shlichus operates for A, but not for B. As far as the Maisa Chalitz is concerned, the Cholitz is operating on behalf of all the brothers. But as far as the Chalutza is concerned, she's not operating on behalf of all the Tzaros. And what does that mean? What that means is that even if Reish Lakish is going to reduce vis-a-vis the Achim, a chi of Kares down to a chi of Lav, that's only vis-a-vis the Chalutza herself. But vis-a-vis the other Tzaros, even Reish Lakish agrees that there's a chi of Kares. And that's what he says in the opening line, Lo nechleku Rav Yochanan Reish Lakish al tzoras achalutza shebein achalutza bein achim chayov and aleo karitz. So why is the tzoras chalutza excluded here? After all, the chalutza herself, the chalutza herself, according to both Reish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan, is down to an Isolat. And if the Chalutz is operating as a, shli, as a Shliach on behalf of all the other Tzaros, then they too should be reduced down to an Isolat. So take, for example, Reish Lakish's opinion that with regard to all the Achim vis-a-vis the Chalutz, they are all reduced from Kares down to Olat because Reish Lakish's shita is the uniformity shita. Why not apply the same logic and the same principle of uniformity vis-a-vis all the tzaros? And yet we find something very strange, that with regard to the relationship between the cholates and the halutza, we reduce it down from kares to alav. But with regard to the tzaros, we leave it as an isakaritz. Well, why is the chalutza different than all the other tzaros? After all, just like you said that the acha cholates is a shliach on behalf of all the achim, and therefore there's a p'tur kares for all the achim with regard to the chalutza, we should say that the Chalitza, which reduced the Chiyuv Kharis down to a lav, vis-a-vis the Chalitza, should now be extended through Shlichus to all of the Tzaras. So the Pnei Moshe gives us a mechanical principle, which honestly, I think, defies human logic. And that is that the shlichus as far as the cholts, but not as far as the tzaros. Maybe because the tzar is playing a passive role. 
I don't mean the tsara, I mean to say the chalutza. Uh, when you look at the cholates and the chalutza, you see the cholates is active and the chalutza is passive. Now, I'm going to ask whether that's true or not in just a second, but let's just, uh, you know, just grant me that premise for one moment. So when you have an active agent, then you can appoint another shliach on behalf of that agent. But if you have someone who's passive, then they are just passively receiving the chalitza and they cannot accept, they cannot be operating on behalf of anyone else because they're not operating at all. They just pass. For example, the Gemara in, in Mesech the Kiddusha has two psukim for shlichus. One for the shlicha, for the makadesh. I'm, I'm sorry. One for the magaresh and one for the miskareshes. Meaning she can appoint the shlich to receive her get. And the Gemara needs a special possible. Because a woman in get is passive. How do you know that she can set up a shlich? Probably a whole different type of shlichus. Now, let's just question for a moment that premise that the cholitz is active and the chalutza is passive. I mean, that's what it sounds like. You know, in Hebrew grammar, cholitz is an active description of a person. Chalutza is passive. But in truth, she's the one who pulls off his shoe. Am I right? So it's a little bit odd to call her passive. But but I think what happens is, is that he has to allow her to pull off his shoe. And, and that's because he decided to forgo Yibo in favor of Chalitza. That was his decision. She had nothing to do with that decision. So in a sense, to effectuate Chalitza, you need him. He's really the active agent. She does a physical action of removing his now, but he's the Chalitza and he's, she's the Chalitza. That's the best I can do. Barid Baz Kosov. I don't know what this footnote here is. Hey, Shom. Okay, fine. Shil Dasa Yushalmi. Afra Achim. Enom Pturim. Okay, Pturim here is Reish Lokish. Mishum Svara Shlichus. We thought that. Since the Torah reduced the Chiv Karisavashis Ach for the Cholates, and the Cholates is now operating on behalf of all his brothers, then likewise, vis a vis the brothers, the Torah has reduced the Lav from a Kares to a regular Lav. He says, no, Afa Cholates Atzmo, Potur, Lomi Shumnitaka Lav, El Kedivre Rabbi Yot, Rabbi Yudin. Okay, here would be Kedai to open up the Yushami, but it says, Lefisha Kvar Nire Liftarba. What does it mean? Very ambiguous words of Rabbi Yudin. Lefisha Kvar Nire Liftarba. Hainu Kisvar Sarajba. Aamurali El. Shanafila Hitira Sisurali Ola. So again, what we're saying is that as far as the Achim are concerned, the reason why there's no Kares, the Koin Tresh Lokish, and the Achim is because as far as Haraj, but since they, there was an Afil Yibam vis-a-vis all the Achim, once the Torah removed the Yisra Eshesach, that's permanent. Now we get to the tsaras. El shehat tsara, ena nifteres. Wonder if he's missing the word ella over here. 
Ela Hatsara Hainan if Tess El Mishum. I'm adding the word El. It's Mishum the Glai Milsa Mafreya. Shalom Nizkikali Achime Olam. And therefore, there's an Easter of Isakaris of Ashes Ach. One second. We're going quite to Ashlock. Oh, yeah, that was as far as the Chalutz is concerned. Reish Lakish says that we reduced it from a Chiv Kares vis a vis a vis the Chalutz. But as far as the tsaros are concerned, everybody agrees that there's a thief chorus. And why is that? Why not use the logic of the Rajpa? And the answer has to be Gloy Milsama Freya Shal Miskaliachme Olo. Look, what can I tell you? I mean, in my, in my, you know, limited brain, the Ridbaz is not adding anything. It's again back to mechanics. He's, he's trying to embellish the mechanics and make it a little more palpable. And so, you know, you can swallow it. But basically, his mechanics is the following, that in the case of the Achim, she, the, right, the ultimate Chalutza fell for even for all the Achim. But in the case of sorrows, then we're going to apply the principle of Lemafreya. We're going to say that only this particular Tzara, the one who got the Chalutza, fell for Yibu. And the other Tzaras never fell for Yibu. Uh, I have a clue why we should make that distinction. Anybody see the logic in that? As far as as far as the brothers are concerned, we're going to say that she fell for even to all the brothers. But as far as the various wives of Ruben, only one of them fell for Yib. Which one? We'll find out after the Chalitz is done. They're very mechanical. It does, there's no lumps here. It's, you know, this is the, you know, Kabbalah Hine Kabbalah. This is the way the Torah happened, according to the Yushalm. All right, so let me just make a note of where we got up to. And so let's go back now. Yud Beis. Is that where we're holding? We're up to Tony Rav Bibi. Let's see if we can find that. I think it's about six lines down to the top. Let's see. Are you based on the base one, two, three, four, five, six? Six lines down. The Tony Rav Bibi Kame de Rav Nach. Rav Bibi brings a brisa to the attention of Rabbi Nach, Rav Nach. This is the question of contraception. And the Torah permits contraception, which is called a moch. I guess you'd loosely translate it as a sponge. And I think in modern uh, lingo, we call it a diaphragm. In three cases. So the three women whose pregnancy would endanger them. Number one is a katana. Number two is muberes. And number three is a menika. 
Again, Rabbi Bose, they don't pass in any shilas here on this, on the basis of this price. But the Brisa seems to be assuming that for a pregnant woman or a nursing woman to get pregnant, which I don't know how commonplace that could be, that's a danger. Whether it's a danger to the mother, might be a danger to the fetus, or in the case of Mainika, might be a danger to the baby that was born already. This we'll have to analyze. So these three categories are permitted to use a moch during Tashman Shamit. And uh, ah, so it's interesting. What I presented to you was Rashi's translation, his understanding of this price. But it seems that Tosfus and many other showed him have a different take on this price. What they're saying is that in these three cases, they're obligated to put in a moch. In other cases, they have the option. It's their decision. She'll decide whether she wants to insert a moch or not. Because women are not obligated to mix a period of a rhythm. So let's keep this machlokus in mind as we go through this. Ano shemitis aber Bishema Tomos. Right? We're afraid that she might become pregnant and she'll die. Now, the body is too frail to survive a birth. Meuberes, Shema Tase Ubra Sando. So the danger here is not to the mother as in the case of a katano, but rather to the uber, to the fetus itself. And again, I can't give you the biology of it. I don't know, okay, if we can, we can research this. The, the word sandal is, is, is not a, it's not a clinical word. You know, sandal is kind of like a borrowed, a borrowed phrase. Yeah, but I'm not sure how miscarriages work. I mean, it, does the word miscarriage always indicate that the fetus was messed up? By definition, is that a miscarriage? But there is something called a stillborn. Did you ever hear that? I mean, yeah. a stillborn, I think... Oh, is a normal baby with sort of like all the all the organs I think are right. So maybe the word miscarriage would be would be appropriate, but sandal is is a vlacha enlo turas punin. Yeah. Then he adds two words, which I'm not sure what he gains by that. Kedag hasando. What does that mean? Like the fish. It's a deformant. Squash. So somehow, if conception takes place during pregnancy, then it's going to end up in a deformity of the ubar. It's almost as if the, the conception creates an, another ubar and that fetus doesn't tolerate the first ubar. Like pushes it out, you know, get out of here. You know, I want to take over. Meinika. Shemetigmol bina viyamos. As a result of the fact that she gets pregnant, then what happens is the chalav in, in the 
in the mother is necha. Necha means it gets messed up. And therefore, her child is going to have to wean, be weaned. It cannot, it cannot be breastfed. Because as a result of the pregnancy, nechar hachalv. And that's not going to be healthy for the, for the newborn baby to, to breastfeed. The word tigmal means to wean, you know, to terminate breastfeeding. And, you know, today we have all sorts of very sophisticated uh, materner, materna and all that stuff. You know, it's a multi-billion dollar enterprise business, you know, to sell this kind of materna, that kind of materna, and other companies that compete with materna. But back in the day, nursing was a matter of life and death to sustain the life of the newborn baby. I mean, a whole bunch of thoughts flood my mind. For example, Rav Hankin, who was the final word in Sak in America until, until he died and then Rav Moshe came along. Rav Hankin was very liberal with regard to contraception. After a woman gave birth, he would allow her four years, if I'm not mistaken. Don't quote me on this. This is in a tshuva book called B'nai Bonham. <laughs> and uh, during the, and he borrowed it from nursing. That Again, this is back in the Gemara's time. A baby would nurse for four years. Today, is if a woman goes two years, it's a lot. So that since nursing is almost an automatic natural contraception, he felt that four years was the time to space between one child and another that would give the mother an opportunity to raise the child until the child is mature, is four years old. And now's the time to have another child. I mean, this can very radical in the world of Psa. Another thought that comes to my mind is a story about the Rogachan. And a woman was nursing and she brought her, her young baby to, to the Rogachan because the baby stopped nursing. And she felt this was very dangerous. This is only a hundred years ago. But yet nursing was considered so important. Anyway, it's an amazing story because the rugged shepherd interrogated her. And he decided that the reason why the baby stopped nursing is because she changed her clothes. Because he checked out at what point he stopped nursing, it was on Yontif, this Shabbos, when she would change her clothes. And he based it on a Gemara Bavakama that says you could have a Shor Naghan on Yontif, meaning he only gores people or other animals on Yontif because on Yontif people wear different clothing and he gets all agitated. He doesn't recognize people that he recognizes during the week. And the Rogachev made an equation between a shar and, a, and an infant and a baby. Anyway, the this, this, this story has a happy ending. She started nursing on Yontif with her regular weekday clothes, and the baby started nursing again. It's a pretty amazing story. I mean, the Rogachev, I don't think, was the greatest expert on nursing. If he was, then he only got it from the Torah. A folkba, a folkba, the kulaba. But in any event, there are, there, you know, nursing was very, very important back in the day. I mean, it's important even today, but today you can, you know, you can hear about a lot of women who cannot nurse and yet they have many children and they, they raise them on, on materna and so on. What age are we talking about that it's dangerous if she gets pregnant? 
And the Gemara says that Mibas Achatis Reishon of Yom Echad at Shtemis Reishon of Yom Echad. We're going to allow, again, I'm going with Rashi, we're going to allow for a moth in the case of that last year, the final year of Hakatus between 11 and 12, that's when she could get pregnant, and that's when pregnancy would endanger her life. However, if she's less than 11, then she will not get pregnant at all, so there's nothing to worry about. Yes, if she's past the age of 12, then even if she gets pregnant, she will not, her life is not in jeopardy. And therefore, so the mayor is very stingy about this permissibility of a moch for the purpose of, for the sake of a katana, he limits it to that last year, 11 to 12. In other words, even if she is 11 years old, and even if she's less than 11 or more than 12, Not sure why, why he has to add that point. I mean, there's no machlokas about the case where she's less than 11 or more than 12. So I'm not sure why the Chacham have to re-emphasize what we saw in Rabbi Meir. Because the machlok between Chacham and Rabbi Meir is about a girl who's 11 years old. And the Chachamim apply the principle of mina shamayim yirachamu. A pasuk in Shomer Psoyim Hashem. Have you ever heard of this? Shomer Psoyim Hashem? No? Shomer Psoyim Hashem, which is a pasuk in it's like a, a password. It's like a, what, how, can, how can I, it's, it's, it's a phrase that has a meaning way beyond the literal translation, and it's used as a lachic concept. I'll give you an idea. Again, this is going to be shocking to you if you never heard this, but from Moshe Feinstein, in his original chub about smoking, permitted smoking, based on this puzzle, Shomer P'sayim Hashem, that God will protect the simple. What does that mean, God will protect the simple? For example, let's, I'm just imagining that somebody came along and said to you, you're not allowed to cross the street. Because in Israel, never the amount of car accidents and people who are killed by crossing the street is very high, and it's dangerous to cross the street. So what will you answer to him? Shomer p'soyim Hashem. Everybody's crossing the street. That's the way we live. You want to get across the street, you got to cross the street. Be careful when you cross the street. So I don't know if the Torah is going to per, per hit, is going to permit walking a tightrope over Niagara Falls or other extreme sports that you know about today. You know, mountain climbing and all sorts of craziness. Then we're not going to apply Shomer Psalm. Shomer Psalm Hashem applies when you're in a normal behavior pattern. And God will protect you. And Ramosha spoke about a time period where everybody spoke. I'm exaggerating when I say everybody spoke. For example, I never saw my father with a cigarette. But before I was born, he stopped smoking when I was an embryo, when he had a massive heart attack. They tell me, I can't believe it, that my father was a chain smoker. I never saw him hold a cigarette. When I was 18 years old, 19 years old, I learned at Yeshiva here in Yushalayim. And I don't know if I ever told you this. If you went up to the Ezra's Nachshid, which was like a half a flight up, and there were Trisim, you opened the Trisim, you couldn't see a thing. Mm-hmm. I'm, not, I'm not joking. The whole, it was a cloud of, and it wasn't the Anani I covered. Everybody smoked. 
there was a fellow in the yeshiva who made his living. He used to take, I don't know if they still exist, Time cigarettes. I remember this from my youth. There was a cigarette company here in Israel called Time. He would take a box of Time cigarettes and he would glue it to a wall in the back of the big spedrish. And it was a pushka. Yeah, every time you took a cigarette, you put in ten agarot into the pushka. It was a time when if the kolel guys asked for a raise in the milga, you know, the stipend for kolel, they would prove that they needed an, up, an upgrade in their kolel stipend because the price of cigarettes went up. That's how you decided whether or not there was inflation. When I was 14 years old, I was tested by the mashkiach in the yeshiva. His name was Remendel Zax. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He was married to the Chofetz Chaim's daughter. He used to smoke half cigarettes. He would take a cigarette, cut it in half, and smoke it until his fingers were burning, were yellow. Smoking was the name, you know, was the way of the li- way of life. I mean, women when they started with the women's lip movement, they wanted special cigarettes for women. What were they called, Virginia Slims or something? I'm trying to remember from my youth. So the women were jealous because the men were all smoking and they weren't smoking. They wanted to prove themselves to be hush, so they were also smokers. <clears throat> so why am I pointing this out to you? Because Shomer Psalm Hashem was Rav Moshe's original opinion. He changed his mind in a later uh, tshuva after the Surgeon General's report, and he prohibited smoking. But it was a reverse, a total reverse of his position. It originally said Shomer Psalm Hashem. So the Chachamim say that a woman who's having a relationship with her husband and she might get pregnant. And that's, that's part of life. God will protect. So, for example, you know, you get on an airplane. Never, we've heard of so many accidents on airplanes just recently. Well, how many yeshiva books, I think two or three were, were killed in a, a small airplane plane. It happens all the time. One of my best friends, he lost his father when, when he was a kid to an airplane crash. So we're going to say we can't fly an airplane. I and mean, there are people today who don't fly an airplane because they they have psychological phobias about flying. I have an aunt by marriage. She would never get on an airplane. I mean, she would need therapy. Oh, by the way, I have a friend who went to psych- who's a PhD in psychology, former Talmud of my and he specialized, he wrote his PhD thesis for his doctorate in psychology on how to, uh, what's it called, D program, you know, someone who's afraid of flying. But the Lemaise, everybody flies on planes. Maybe not during Corona, but so we have a principle of Shomer Psoyim Hashem. Anyway, the Gemara says the following, Midaka Omar Shematis Aber Vishematamus. The Gemara is afraid of two things. She might get pregnant, this Ketano, and she might die in birth. It seems from the fact that the Bryce had to add on this extra Chayshin on Shema that maybe she'll die, that she might not necessarily die. Why is that important for us? We're learning the Sefti Yavamas. Why is it important to come to the conclusion that it's possible for a Ketana to get pregnant and survive the pregnancy? Im Kain says the Gemara, Matsinu Chamoso Mima Entis. Okay. Utran so the Mishnah tells us that you could never find a case of Chamoso 
different permutations of chamozo that became an island because chamozo means a mother-in-law. And a woman could only be a mother-in-law if she had a daughter or a son. And therefore the Mishnah says that you, you will never find miun in a case of chamosa. Why? Because miun only applies to Kiduche Kitana, and a chamosa can never be a Kitana because chamosa means she had a child, and a Kitana can never have a child. Again, there are like a number of assumptions there, but if you follow the Chadganya, the Mishnah says that a Ketana, who's a Mema Enes, could never possibly be Chamosa, because she couldn't have gotten pregnant and had a child. But yet we were Mithayik from this Brisa, that it is possible for a Ketana to have a child. Again, it's very, very dangerous. But if she gets pregnant, let's say there's a 50% chance she won't survive the birth, 50% chance she will give birth. And if she gives birth, she can become chamoso, even though she's still a ktana hamima enes. So the Gemara answers, what does it mean that the Mishnah tells us, iata motzi, iata yochalom v'chamoso, etc. shenimtu shemianu? There's the Gemara. Ava, it doesn't mean that there are two different spakos, the way we interpreted the Bryce, but rather Shemitis Aber Vitos. Again, that's not what it says in the Bryce. The Bryce says Shemitis Aber Vishema Tomos, but now we're taking out the word Vishema and we're reading it Shemitis Aber Vitos. Take out the Shema. Yoma Rabbar Levi. Gvul yesh la. There's a certain interval of time in our life for a, for a, for a girl that she's misaberes umesa, and that's between the ages of 11 and 12. If during that year of her life she becomes pregnant, she will not survive the birth process. And maybe you could add here that in such a case, she'd be allowed to, to abort because otherwise she's going to perish. So during this one year of time, between 11 and 12, if she gets pregnant, then she will die. If she's older than that, she can go for a full term and give birth, and she won't die. If she's younger than 11, no problem, she won't become pregnant. But between 11 and 12, she'll become pregnant and she'll die. Well, the Gemara says, Amy, is this really so? And in this formulation of Rabbah, it says Shekvar Yoldu, which means that she didn't have two saros, Loi Vishte saros, which means that she's still considered Alachti Akitano. And nevertheless, she gave birth and she's still alive. But rather, Mishum She Yoldu, Loi Tachinchet the Mayan. In other words, the fact that she gave birth removes her mean status. That's what it means, Shekvar Yold. Once they gave birth, and that's called Chamoso, if they're still before Shtei Saros and the Ketano, then it's impossible to have Chamoso Mima Enes because there's no mean in this case. According to Rabbi Bar Levoy, a katana could not give birth at all during that year. So the Bryson should have said that we can't find the Mitzvah, a reality of Chamosom in my ends. If there's a Chamosom and she gave birth, and by definition we have to assume she's a Gedola, and therefore she can't be in my ends. Whereas, according to Rabbi Bar Shmuel, she could be a katana, 
she's chamoso, she had a baby, and she's alive to tell the story. But there's no meal because kfar yoldu. And what's kfar yoldu? There's no meal. Right, so this is this is where we got up to for today. So Mirz Hashem, we'll pick it up tomorrow with Ella Leolam here in the middle of Yudbeis Amid Beis.